I would like to um, move over to the panel and give each panelist uh, the word for a couple of minutes to make their points, and then we will address the questions you have in the program. Uh, Mr. Griffiths, maybe you could start. much for the introduction. Good, that's working. Um, I'm reminded of some years ago a conversation I had when I was actually running the commercial side of a long-haul airline with an airport operator who I won't embarrass by naming him, but he, he managed an airport, quite a large airport to the west of London. And um, he, I said to him, who, who owns the passenger here? Who, who really has the influence over the passenger? How do you look at the customer that goes through the airport. And he said, well, we regard airlines as suppliers of customers to the airport. And as an airline, I looked at that and I thought, I didn't really like that statement because I don't think it's correct. My view has always been that to make uh, a customer happy, we should really be taking the lead from the supply chain of other industries, the automotive industry, food industry, the oil industry, where basically everyone works together in partnership to produce an excellent, efficient product. And actually, who owns the customer is a sort of secondary argument. But I really do believe an airport is a critical part of the supply chain. And most of the relationships that airports have are business-to-business -business relationships. And we facilitate the differentiation of products and service on the ground for our airline customers in the same way that they're trying to differentiate their products and service in the air. So it's a very critical relationship. And um, I, I think really the B to C, the business to consumer relationship, is the preserve of the airline. And it's up to the airport to do everything they possibly can to make sure that that's is of the highest possible standard of, of, of all time. And I think our real key priority is to deliver sufficient capacity with sufficient quality at the right time to facilitate the growth and the improvement of service quality um, for our airline customers. So that, I believe, is where the airport sits in the delivery of the product to the end customer, who is very much the uh, property of, of the airline. They spend all the money on the marketing and sell the tickets, etc. So I don't think there's any doubt in my mind where our responsibilities lie. Thank you very much. Um, maybe I'll give the word just directly onwards. Thank you. Uh, ten years ago, I used to spend a lot of time uh, arguing with my airline uh, colleagues about that, but I think it's not very important right now. Uh, and it's, it's almost good that everyone is trying to be possessive about that, that, that passenger because ultimately that means that everyone will try to do their best. Um, putting definitely my career uh, airport uh, hat on, I feel that that customer, very often most of that customer, especially the OD one, will continue to come to the airport uh, irrespective of which airline is serving that airport and uh, airlines very often uh, come and go. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we can ignore the important role that airlines play in uh, delivering that customer, especially transfer customers uh, to our airports. Uh, the, the other thing I, I want to say is that you cannot be a good airport operator if you don't understand that passenger and what that passenger means. And the airline cannot be a surrogate in explaining to you uh, that passenger and the characteristics and the requirements of that passenger. So um, I think uh, to be a good operator of an airport, you really need to know the details and you really need to touch that passenger at all points, all the touch points that, uh, that are there. And if there is time, I can talk maybe a little bit about what we are doing at our airports to do that. But that also doesn't mean that the airline doesn't play an important role. I'm sure Mr. Ali will have a different perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. I, I, I guess I feel I'm the minority here. Most of the audience seems to be airport people and the panelists, so uh, absolutely right. I, I think uh, uh, from my perspective, uh, airlines are, are, are an airport got to be uh, together into one. We, we are the, the, the buses and the airports are the bus stops. And, and you need both for this business to work. 
Of course, the, the better airports, the more they do the touching, as you said, not necessarily the physical, but, but the, 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 the feeling of the touches, uh, the happier the customers are, and when they, they, it makes our life much easier. It, it's, of course, it's amazing from a, a customer point of view. Uh, most of the time, particularly in the region we are in, the, the, the Middle East or the MENA area, you'll find they're limited to the choice. Therefore, if it goes good, it reflects very good for the airline. And they say, we traveled on this airline and they were very good. If the airport is bad, when they walk out, they can't blame a building. They tend to blame an airline as well. Having said that, customers are getting intelligence all the time. And now they can have the ability to differentiate and say, well, I had a good experience with the airline, but the airport was bad, or the airline was bad and the airport was good. And I think we've got a mix of examples. Some, some, some we've got fantastic airports around us, and some airports still tend to live on the dark ages. Our, our, our sort of need at, at, at the airline front is, of course, you need a balance between a big international airport and you need a lot of regional airport to make sure that uh, the, the people don't have to go through the same process for one hour journey and for 12 hour journey. But I'm sure more will come in, in the debate as we talk. Thank you very much, Mr. Heinz. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, it's actually a privilege to talk to you since I'm from the industry and I cannot tell you how to build an airport. But uh, I want to talk about trends and brands. And I'm very happy about the uh, two days title, Becoming the Airport of Choice for Airlines and Passengers. This is where it starts. I would change the word passenger into customer. And I'll tell you why. We had trends for many, many years. We had a trend uh, of, uh, historically, we had a trend where we concentrated on the um, handling of the aircraft. Then we had a trend of the IT. Finally, we had a trend of security and non-aviation revenue. And during all that time, nobody talked about the passenger. So what is an airport going to do to make a passenger to a customer? Again, coming from the industry, uh, the industry created, created brands. Everybody wants to have an iPhone, and everybody wants to uh, drive a Porsche. But uh, when you think, who decides to go a, to a particular airport because this airport delivers something special to him? Developing a unique sales, sales point for the airport, which means you give the customer something, he wants to come to you. Let's assume you have a passenger in Europe who wants to go to the Far East. And many airlines offer that trip. When you have an airport who tells this passenger, like a good brand, I want to go to this particular airport because there is what I want to get, where I get the service, where I have something special. And this is where the airport is no longer, as you said, uh, uh, as the uh, second handler. He is then at the driver's seat. He makes himself so important that the customer or the uh, passenger wants to come, as well as the airline. And this is actually the issue of the future. This is what the industry created. The industry created brands. When I uh, name Nestle or uh, Porsche, you immediately have something in mind. So perhaps in future, when I say Dubai Airport, you have something in mind, or another airport. Something particular this airport has, I want to go to. And this is actually the trend we have. And I attended a couple of conferences recently, and I realized that this trend is now all over the world. Everybody is now concentrating on the passenger because of the competition. 20 years ago, we didn't talk about competition amongst airports. Now we have a competition uh, amongst airports, amongst cities, amongst countries, and you have to deliver something special, and I must admit, Dubai delivered already something special. Many people come here, not only because of the airline or the airport, about the environment. 
because the environment has also, the people have to identify themselves with the airport and the airline, and then you create something special where the passenger wants to come to. I'm not talking about Berlin, by the way. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think these introductory statements were very interesting, and um, uh, there are two points, I mean, which we have heard um, from those statements. One is the airline side, a bit um, from the airline manager also among us, but then the passenger side of the last uh, spoken words, very much the customer value. Do we deliver value to the customer? Now, Mr. Griffith, what do you think if if you have a very modern and new airport, which definitely from an infrastructural perspective creates an interesting environment and a nice environment for passengers, but on the other hand, we have size of airports. And then somehow, is there a conflict between the size of an airport where you probably have difficulty or have to create services and value to customers on a different level than if you have a smaller airport where you maybe need less or more time? Well, I think the first thing is that um, people travel because they want to get to the place that they've elected to travel. Um, that's very important for airports where the predominance of traffic is point to point. But when you get a hub airport that has a predominance of connecting traffic, they are actually competing with other hub airports for the world market. So it's a very different dynamic. Um, I think the thinking in airport design is changing. And I think also there is a realization that if we simply amplify the current processes being operated in the airport environment and make those of mega proportions, then it's just not going to work. There is an optimal size and scale. And I believe also that we are behind other industries in embracing technology. I mean, why can't we deal with baggage check-in right at the beginning of the journey um, before the customer leaves home, for example. And uh, why can't we deal with some of the known in information about that passenger before they arrive at the airport? So that's, that's coming slowly with things like um, APIS data being captured and also with, with online check-in at home, etc. But I think really we need to rethink the entire airport process. The days when we corral hundreds of thousands of people into the same single point of departure rather than taking people directly to their aeroplane. I think those will change. So I think there's an optimal size of concourse that needs to be considered that is good for retail, good for scale of operation, good for security, good for passenger flow, but also good to cut down things like walking distance, connecting time between planes, and technology and software, I think, is going to play a big role in making sure that the efficacy of the passenger experience is improved going forward. Hub airports do compete. Um, there's no doubt in my mind, a lot of the traffic that we get at Dubai International, up to about 80% of our connecting traffic, could easily use another hub, either in the region or in Europe or in the Far East. And if we don't work very hard on making sure that the ease and convenience of the connection between uh, planes is, is actually maximized to the benefit of the customer, then we will start to lose market share. So we're very mindful as you grow that you have to put more and more attention to the interests of the customer. I think these were very interesting statements you made. Are, are these what you mentioned, these new uh, kind of ideas or processes? Could that be new critical factors for airports uh, in the future? May I raise the question to Dr. Youssef? Um, cer certainly, there are uh, a lot of opportunities to enhance the way that we design and operate airports. I think for many years our industry has been stuck in a time warp called the IATA Design Reference Manual. And uh, I think we really need as, as airport professionals to come up with a better way to, uh, to, to set standards in our industry so that the airports that we design are, are better suited for the passengers and more customer friendly. I think that's one of the, the, the major uh, obstacles that we face as an industry, that the, uh, historically the, uh, the design standards or parameters are really coming from the airline industry. And even if you read these documents, it, it, it warns you against uh, retail. It says don't do retail and be, uh, uh, because it might interfere with the flow of passengers. Uh, so I think uh, it's our fault that we as an industry haven't come up with more creative uh, solutions to designing airports. 
unfortunately. So you, you mentioned, uh, just as your last word, some more creative solutions. Uh, creative solutions. Um, I would like to, um, to move the discussion to Mr. Um, Ali as an airline manager uh, and ask what are the critical factors from an airline perspective when sure. we look at an airport effectiveness. Sorry, I couldn't get the question. Sorry, um, what, are, um, what are critical factors then from an airline's perspective if we look at the effectiveness of an airport? The expectation from an airline from, to the airport. Yes. I guess to, to start with, you've you got to, airlines look for a few things. One is, is efficiency. Uh, aircraft supposed to be in the sky. And efficient airports tend to give you the fastest turnaround. And with that has to come, we want those airplanes to be flying safe in one piece. So, you know, it's quite a lot of responsibility on the airport operators when it comes to making sure that all the, the safety parameters of the airport is intact and with that deliver the efficiency of it. Um, I think as, as uh, Paul said, there are, there are hub airports and, and, and there are point-to-point -point airports. Um, because a point-to-point -point customer wants to come to the air, to spend as little time as possible at the airport, get out and, and, and just go, go and do your things. Where, where, the, where the, the, the hub airport is the requirement and the dynamics of it extremely different. Um, the, 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 sim simply, uh, so long as the efficiency exists at the airport, uh, cost becoming a burden on every airline and on every business we run. And I think that there are some airports who have, uh, in, in the MENA region at least, have gone online uh, with recognizing that and, and making sure that they work as a partner to ensure not necessarily not to increase the cost, but to make sure that the costs are contained as much as possible. Um, others have probably moved into the same attitude as probably BAA has got nowadays of the, the higher I can charge, the better. Uh, and, and, and those are, if we, we go to the concept of, of this particular session, if you refer to the airport of the choice, certainly they wouldn't be the airline's choice to choose those airports if the airline had a choice to choose an airport. But they, regrettably, a lot of countries in the, the, the MENA region do not have that choice of which airport to, to use. Uh, an example of United Arab Emirates, the size of the country, we are privileged to have seven airports, and therefore the competition is there, and everybody tries to develop as much as they could uh, the standards as well as uh, the pricing. Therefore, the airlines do have a choice to make, and, and the country is not, not uh, huge in size. Uh, therefore, you drive from one end of Abu Dhabi to Fujairah, it takes about a couple of hours. And people can use those choice, and the airline can choose the, choose the. In some other countries where they have multiple airports, uh, have been a scenario of, uh, although there are lots of airports, but the, the entire country airports run by one company, one handling agency, uh, and, and probably most of the time you find the more smaller airport have got a surcharge punishing, uh, punishing the customers for using them. So some gets confused the purpose of actually having more than one airport if you want to operate that methodology. So if I understand you right, that uh, you say it's one interesting point here that depending on the availability of airports in a specific region and the, the, the number of airports, the, the, uh, on one hand the competition question which was raised before um, might be less or more um, significant, so you might have less, um, um, let's say, possibilities to uh, based on your cost and tur turnaround times and your, your factors to decide on different airports or less. So that's, I think, an interesting statement. Yeah. Do we now have two different situations? Depending on regions, we do have more or less competition or are we dealing here with uh, different airports where we, where we look at, on one hand at, uh, uh, let's say, uh, global hubs uh, and on the other hand at more regional airports? Um, I, I think the thing is it depends very much on the traffic base. A point-to-point -point airport is highly dependent on the quality and disposition of its catchment area. 
And clearly, passengers starting their journey or terminating their journey want an airport that's as close as possible to their ultimate destination. So if they're traveling point to point, um, clearly the catchment area and the location is incredibly important. And I think also the second point is on, on when you've got the same catchment area shared by a number of airports, there is the differentiating factor of the pricing point and the style of the airline operation. So, you know, where you've got the London system, for example, you've got many different airports, some of which are heavily patronized by low-cost carriers and therefore are attracting a more mobile um, catchment area, broader catchment area, because the pricing point is lower. I think the, the pricing point of a hub airport is less relevant because the thing is that they are competing not for the point-to-point -point traffic. So the actual specific location is not as important because you can actually transit through a number of different hubs. Um, but I do think that the thing is all airports, irrespective of the style of operation, they have a duty to make sure that they deliver the most cost-effective infrastructure that delivers the level of service quality and capacity required by the airline, uh, and also that they make sure that they harmonize their business to produce the best possible return. And I really do think that the objectives that Dubai Airport strives to achieve are, are low bottom quartile aeronautical charges, recognizing the fact that without airlines bringing passengers in very large quantity, the airport would have no business at all and supplementing that income by growing its uh, non-aeronautical revenue component significantly and to derive more and more percentage of, of that income from retail operations and commercial operations, which is really getting people to buy things that they want to buy at airports. So I, I agree, the IATA design manual should have really been in the bin before it was written because you wouldn't ask you know, Steve Jobs to consult some external design manual when he was producing the iPhone and the iPad. So why should airports not embrace innovation? We've got a lot of catching up to do, I think, to be properly customer orientated. And the commercial model needs to work for everyone in the supply chain, for the airline, for the customer, for the commercial people, for the shareholders. Everyone, I think, can make it work in harmony and partnership. And it's uh, very interesting. It leads me to the, to the next question we have here um, about um, um, how or what airport leaders could actually do uh, to understand their customers' needs and to improve customer experience quality better. And I would like to ask Mr. Heinz what he, from his industrial, uh, industrial experiences, uh, can tell us here about um, what could be done. Yeah, actually, the uh, industry always delivered what the airports asked for. And, uh, for example, what we discuss in our community of the industry is we should provide um, the airports with systems and ideas which concentrate finally on the uh, passenger. Because when the passenger is happy, the airport is happy, and he's ready to pay for our goods. And as long as I look back, we always, the industry always could provide proper facilities, but it was never the responsibility of the uh, industry to create uh, the airport. But our, let's say our, what we thought is, as soon as we can make an airport stress-free uh, with the assistance of ideas, of industrial components, that we are on the right way. The decision how the airport has to look like finally is up to the airport and uh, this is actually not where I can give any recommendations. The only thing is what we discuss tomorrow is sustainability, is quality and uh, the idea to make the airport or to make the passenger and the customer happy. The customer feels only happy when he's finally when he is having his seat in the airplane. All everything between uh, all that uh, production waste when he enters the airport, he goes to customs, he has to shop something, he buys something, is not stress-free. And I'm wondering whether it will ever happen that you can get a stress-free airport. Anyhow, we uh, will do our best to provide the right systems and components 
to reach that goal. So there, uh, the um, customer, um, let's say, the understanding of the customer can be linked to components and therefore construction. But how do we understand um, what happens and how customers change? I mean, um, maybe uh, Dr. Youssef, in uh, uh, Istanbul, you have bigger projects um, going on for the future and uh, everyone looks a bit um, to you. How do you see the difference and how do you do, how do you look at the future markets which you expect probably to grow pretty much if you build those infrastructures? Well, uh, for, if you don't mind, first about the customer. We uh, started uh, Istanbul 13 uh, years ago or so. And uh, we started in a very traditional approach where we uh, were the landlord and we invited a lot of companies to come and do business at our airport. And we quickly realized that that doesn't really work very well in emerging markets because the capacity to provide uh, these kinds of services at a very high quality was not there. And so ultimately what we did is we started um, uh, joint venturing with uh, established partners in the industry, but we were taking the lead. And so today if you enter into uh, one of our airports, you are first met by security staff that are employed by TAV, and they are trained properly in order to be able to de-stress the passenger uh, as much as possible, of course, within the constraints of, of the law. Uh, one of our companies is the largest ground handling company in uh, Istanbul, so the person that you are checking in with is probably one of our staff. And uh, unfortunately, not passport control, although it would be nice, but. Uh, when you go and buy perfume from our shop, it will be uh, one of our staff. And if you want to buy a sandwich or a drink, it's one of our staff. And then uh, the lounges are run by our company. Um, this happened at a time when the uh, legacy airports were basically divesting from all these businesses. The Europeans were always saying, this is not a core business. We need to get out of it. It's cheaper to find someone else to do something like this. Uh, for us, we felt it was important. And the other important thing is technology, IT. Our IT company is providing all the IT solutions in our airport, and that gives us very fast uh, feedback about what's going on in the airport. I don't have to rely in, in my business on uh, one of the duty-free company telling me that there's something wrong in the airport or one of the ground handling companies. I don't have to look at contracts between me and, and, and these uh, service providers to be able to solve problems. Things can be done in a very dynamic way. And so that brings us very close as close as possible to our passengers and helps us better understand how, uh, how the trends are changing, where we are failing, and how we can address some of the problems that inevitably come up in our industry. Um, very interesting. From going back to the customer's understanding or to understand that the needs of the customers, I mean, in, in Dubai, where you have um, this great um, new airport, do you see the airport also as a kind of a destination for a tourist from a passenger perspective? Um, I think we take a rather integrated view of Dubai being the destination and we're very proud of the fact that we've grown our origin and destination markets almost as fast as we've grown our transfer markets. So clearly the whole integration of the tourism infrastructure, hotel stock, uh, the transport infrastructure and of course one constant has been the, the weather here which is uh, pretty nice year round so it's actually becoming, it's adding the whole attractiveness to the destination and I think the airport infrastructure if that's slick and easy and efficient and there's enough capacity so that airlines can put more and more planes in and, and can actually add capacity and, and lift and the quality of the service and the competitiveness of the commercial offer um, also improves as well, then you've got a recipe for success because everything is then properly integrated. And it's, it's, it's quite interesting to note the number of people that are aligned in the business here in Dubai and the results, I think, speak for themselves. I think when you look at other countries, and there are structural reasons for this, people aren't as aligned around the focus on tourism being good for the economy, the fact that, that in Dubai we can actually name what the percentage contribution is, 22 billion US dollars a year, which is 28% uh, of GDP, 19% of people employed here are directly employed by the travel and tourism industry. So it's a huge benefit to 
uh, the nation. And I think the, the whole idea that customer service has a big impact, not just on the hub market, but the idea of the origin and destination market growing at the same time, it's, it's an important part. Airports as a destination in their own right, I'm not sure. I think most people, when they arrive at an airport, they're they measure the quality of the service of the airport, so how quickly they can get through it into their taxi or their car and, and to their hotel. That, that's the measure of a good airport process. It's interesting what you say, um, because on the other hand, we see it in partly in uh, information countries, but we have one case also in Zurich, where I'm from, where airports start to build some kind of metropolis or kind of uh, whole cities, kind of, uh, they start to build destinations in destinations, and there is some kind of a, a trend in this direction in, at some places. There are some conferences on, on airport metropolis. Uh, how would you address this? Well, I think the thing is, it, it depends what you mean by metropolis. I mean, Clearly, the whole project of Dubai World Central is to make sure that all the associated businesses that are dependent on transport um, are attracted to that hub. And, you know, we've got 148 square kilometers. That's, uh, I think, something like 19,200 football pitches to build. And the idea is that the airport will be the centerpiece of that, but all of the businesses and the industry and the conference centers and, and the attractions around it will be um, fueled by the presence of the airport there. And we've seen in lots of other countries how you know, people gravitate towards um, airports because clearly they're major employers. So you get a huge um, sort of honeypot of people wanting to be close to the airport. Um, so the idea of an aerotropolis as a, as a city with all the associated attractions and uh, benefits of that clearly is part of the design. But um, that is very much about business and um, attracting people there because of employment. Thank you very much for this statement. I would like to move to another question and get another question uh, into the round here uh, concerning accessibility. Which accessibility and location characteristic should a top rated airport have? What is crucial to become actually a top-rated airport from a, a regional perspective. Um, I may uh, raise this question first uh, to Mr. Ali from uh, an airline perspective. Thank you. I, I, I guess the regional and international airport, uh, you know, the regional, the definition we use more of a smaller airport where a main airport is, is the bigger ones. Um, Airports, obviously, you want the best catchment area. Uh, more people live in the, the, the round the airport in you know, a few miles, you know, within the 50 miles surrounding, uh, catchment area makes a big difference if you are a point-to-point -point airport. Um, if you are in a, 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 a hub and spoke airport, then, of course, you need infrastructure within that airport, uh, be it facilities as such as runways, uh, aerospace becomes a crucial important thing because you want a lot of airplanes landing at the same time and taking off at the same time and therefore you know a lot of parking space the whole infrastructure has to be different um, in, in, in all cases uh, I go back to what I said earlier on as, as, as an airline uh, your the, the first attraction uh, that you'll have to fly to any, anywhere is are people going to fly out of that airport? Therefore, the catchment area becomes key issues. There's, you know, there's no point in having an airport in the desert that nobody uh, will ever get to. Uh, but when you build an airport, you build it for you know, 100 years ahead. Therefore, you've got to make sure that within a few years of building that airport, there are, there, it's easy for people to get to. And there are people who will get to it. And, and every airport, when they start building it, it's too far. Uh, I think, I, I recall about 20 years ago, people were saying Abu Dhabi airport is too far. The new airport, not the Batin airport. Today, it's in the, almost in the, in the center because there are a lot of residential and offices at the other side of the airport and so on, and, and, and all the airports will be like, I'm sure the Maktoum Airport, 
one day will be exactly the same. But you need people to, to fly out of that airport. Then you need to make sure you got to look at the infrastructure and the equipment to that airport. Uh, th there are airports where they lack equipment, therefore you need to keep those airplanes much longer. Uh, it, you, weather issues used to be a consideration. Nowadays, technology has taken care of those, those, those matters. You know, the cat, the trees of the airports make you land much easier in, in, in the fog and all, all that sort of areas. So it's, pe it, it's uh, people to travel, it's infrastructure at the airport, and I think uh, cost becomes a driver. Uh, normally, airport charges does not, uh, you know, it's been looked at in terms of percentage of the total airline cost. It used to be a, a fitting within the, the bottom 5% of the total airport cost. Of course, nowadays, some airports, it gets to double digits of those into 10 and 12%. Then you consider, do I need to go to this airport? Especially if, if there are not lucrative business airports in terms of providing you that passengers. Thank you very much um, for this. I would like to add another dimension to the discussion here, and this is the ATC. I mean, what may be done, I mean, ATC has obviously also an impact on um, smooth processes, and there is another dimension. I mean, we talked about passenger flows and how to get passengers to the airports. We, we talked about how to build infrastructure, sufficient infrastructures. We talked about how to get passengers efficiently through. We talked about the linkage between airlines and airports, having fast turnaround times, being efficient from that perspective. But what about ATC, uh, ATC? I mean, air traffic control? Um, what may be done to optimize ATC to enable effective airport operations and reduce the risk of delays for passengers and airlines? May I ask uh, Dr. Youssef uh, first to give a statement on this? Thank you. Uh, I think that uh, there's been a, a growing recognition of the need to better integrate airports with uh, air traffic control. And for example, uh, Turkey is a member of Eurocontrol, and we started very recently, uh, about a year ago, to implement uh, collaborative decision making, uh, which allows uh, all the players uh, to know if there are any delays and, and, and know with a, with a greater uh, amount of certainty when an aircraft will be arriving or delayed. And so all the players on the ground from, from the air side will be able to better handle uh, any changes uh, or any deviations in schedule. Um, I think many airports around the world have tried uh, with uh, mixed uh, success to implement it. It's very complicated and it actually defies logic because it really requires a lot of transparency amongst everyone that works at the airport and uh, very often uh, that transparency is not very welcome. Um, uh, I hope that we will be able to do that in two years and even when you talk to the, the, the leading uh, hubs in, in Europe. Uh, many of them had, have had a very difficult time implementing it with, with, with mixed uh, success. Uh, ATC for us as an airport is like our oxygen. And, uh, you, know, you might as well become a parking lot if you don't uh, have uh, an efficient air traffic control system. Uh, in many parts of the world that services are being more commercialized or more privatized and, and there you see major gains in efficiency. Uh, unfortunately in our part of the world that is not the case. Um, we operate Medina Airport and we have 10 nautical mile, sep mile separation distances between aircraft uh, and most of the aircraft are narrow bodies. This is a huge uh, waste of capacity uh, for us. Uh, and so ultimately I think uh, rather than build new runways, I think we will need to become more efficient when it comes to air traffic control and to better integrate that function with the airport function. I can certainly um, add to those comments and uh, agree with everything you've said. I mean, I, I think the biggest problem that we're going to face, particularly in the Middle East over the next decade, is the congestion in the air. Uh, there's enough runways being constructed, I think. You know, certainly if you look at what's happening um, in the UAE and Doha and uh, other places, there's enough capacity being thought about and constructed on the ground. But there isn't enough action going on to be able to harmonize that capacity into similar capacity increases in the skies. 
And I think the concern here is that we are lagging here in the Middle East, way behind what's happening in other parts of the world, in America, in Europe, in Australasia, where they have actually seen the problems of air traffic control congestion becoming a big single strategic threat. And my belief is that there's got to be two things happen. First of all, it's got to be removed as a local issue. This has got to be something that's harmonized across different national boundaries, across different states, because only by removing the handoff between very relatively small air traffic control areas are you going to be able to unlock the additional capacity and growth necessary to continue to be able to operate um, promptly and efficiently. Um, the, the amount of fuel that's burnt because of needless circling of aircraft waiting to enter the stack at top of descent is, is just scandalous. And I think that what needs to happen here, this needs to be an international initiative within the Middle East to try and harmonize precious air traffic control capacity within some single collective um, enterprise that makes it seamless between countries because we are going to run out of capacity very soon. And no matter how much we invest in airports, in airlines, in aircraft, in technology, unless there's enough space to fly, then this is all going to stay on the ground. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Ali. Yes? I just want to add that the, the air traffic control issue is, is an extremely serious issue that uh, I don't believe it has been taken seriously throughout the Middle East. And as Paul, I think, and Dr. Walid said, it's, 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 it's one of the things that probably will disable this industry to grow. Um, I, I, I noticed that the aircraft themselves have got faster, but the journeys have got long, uh, longer in time uh, for the same airports. You used to go between UAE and somewhere in the Gulf in 45 minutes. Now it takes you an hour and 10 minutes. Uh, some areas that used to take three hours, now it takes three hours and 45 minutes. And you think it does not make a logical sense when you've got a faster airplane for, or for the same uh, amount of distance, it takes longer. And the reason is the aerospace restriction continues to increase uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, I mean, one of the famous, the famous uh, picture that most of the people have seen where if you take a picture of anywhere from 10,000 feet, it's blare, you can't see it anymore, and you go to Google, you can get a clear number of a room in the house. So restricting aerospaces, all what it does, it, it makes at, at cost to this business. Uh, the, the, the airport congestion is a challenge, and I think aerospace restrictions are another challenge, both that requires a lot of investment as well as using the technology, as Dr. Walid said, at, at, uh, at 10 theoretical miles of separation or seven or six. It was great in the 70s and 80s. Uh, today's technology on airplane, if you, even if you cut them into half, you're safe. So you know, those things are serious and it's costly. It really, you know, air, airplanes, so, uh, as small or big ones, uh, hanging in the air for an hour and 45 minutes, they do cost a lot of money burning fuel and, and other things. Uh, it's a serious issue that requires attention. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Ali, also for these statements. I could just prove that we have the same discussions also in, in Zurich and maybe some other places will f face similar issues. Actually, we started a bit late with this discussion and we are um, stopping a little bit late. We are running a bit out of time. Um, I would... Uh, uh, like to thank very much to the members of the podium here for their very insightful comments on those very interesting topics which have been provided by the organization, becoming the airport of choice for airlines and passengers. I think there is a lot of challenges in here, whether it's for airports, airlines, or air traffic controls, as we have heard. Thank you very much. And by this, I would like to hand over the word to the organizer.